In May of 2019, a Cessna 210 in Australia crashed, killing both occupants. Since then, there's been an SB service bulletin out for the 210-177 wing spar. We're going to talk about that in the hangar. I used to be a well-respected member of the aviation community, and then I started flying the Cirrus and that changed. Oh, well, that was great until the engine quit. And all of a sudden, I see these explosions and these trees exploding. I'm walking away a better pilot because of this discussion. Welcome to this episode of In the Hangar. I'm uh, joined by Bill Goble. Again, Bill, thanks for coming out. That's right. Uh, this episode's a pretty serious episode. Pretty serious. Right? We had an airplane crash, and uh, it's the type of airplane I fly, a 210. Mm -hmm. and it happened in Australia, and since then there's been a string of things that have happened to the point where I'm seeing on social media a lot of other fellow 210 owners and the groups are starting to freak out a little bit. And so what I want to do is I want to address exactly what's happened and where we're at with the Cessna service bulletin on the 210 and also the 177 has the same design for that. So with that, why don't you, let's start with the accident. Okay, what the, what the happened? Ex the accident aircraft, this is down in Australia and this is with the Australian, <clears throat> their equivalent of the, the FA down there. Um, Australia does things a little different. They're actually a little more stringent, quite a bit more conservative to our FAA. Um, but regardless, uh, Cessna, More stringent. Yeah, uh, Cessna 210 uh, M Mike model um, geologic survey. They're actually doing some low altitude. They were not pulling G's. They were just doing running tracks back and forth. Uh, the aircraft is about a 6,000 hour aircraft. So a lot of hours. A lot of hours, and actually a U.S. aircraft until just a few years before the incident um, had numerous STCs on it. Again, approved approved changes, propeller, engine upgrades. Um, some other equipment, and then there's some unique equipment for the mission. They had some, again, some kind of tail spars. They had, a, they had a boom off the back, probably doing some magnetic uh, surveying work of that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of unique stuff. Probably so much equipment in there that it's only a two-man aircraft, really, two-person right. aircraft. And it's a six-seater originally. It's a six-seater. <clears throat> so again, um, kind of a unique aircraft, but then it, the mission was just driving back and forth. High-time aircraft. So what happened? Um, aircraft comes out of the sky. Wing separates. Wing separate. Yeah. Wing separates. And actually, what happened is where the wing separated wasn't at the wing; it was in the cabin. Okay. Okay. Between the wing, uh, between your main spar, there's a big machine piece that connects the left and right wing. And again, this is only on the non-strutted two tens. Okay. The the early two tens, the, uh, the two hundred fives, the two hundred sixes, that strutted wing. So this is the cantilever, full cantilever wing. Which also not only the 210, but the 177 has 177, the same design. Yeah, the 177 inherited the same cardinal. part. The, the cardinal inherited the same part. So what this affects, or the family of aircraft that it, that it affects, is all the cardinals, the 177A, B, the RG, and the French RGs. Okay, that whole family, okay. all, all cardinals, essentially. And then on the 210 family, it's the 210Gs all the way up through the Rs, including turbo and pressurized aircraft. So including the P's. Including the P's. Okay. okay. Um, and the way the, the way the cabin's loaded, it really doesn't affect, the, the P doesn't really affect anything at all. But again, all, everything from 210G on. So okay. if you have a non-strutted 210, you're in the barrel, so to speak. Okay, so they had a modified engine, modified propeller, modified uh, airframe, yep. um, and the wing came off. Right. Were they doing any kind of special load factoring through some the, of the flying and everything? Again, everything, no, everything was approved. Most okay. importantly is everything was approved. approved. Okay. By the stringent Australian equivalent of the FAA. And the FAA. And the FAA. Yeah, and the FAA with, with okay. STCs, FAA, STC. So, again, it's an approved configuration, but they had a mishap. Now, what causes the mishap? On this particular aircraft, there was a fatigue origin. Fatigue origins were, you, again, that, that as you're getting load cycles, your ground, air, ground, or you're going through, say, turbulence at right. high gross weights, you're having a cyclical load unload of the, of the spar section. What a fatigue origin is, is where a crack starts. Now, what typically happens, and I've opened up aircraft where that headliner, if you've had your headliner out, right. there's foam in there, there's insulation, all sorts of stuff. When the aircraft was new to keep everything quiet and all that, but it's also wicks moisture. Okay. Okay, so now, What's the problem? Corrosion was a problem. It was a corrosion pit. That was the origin. There was a, basically a, a little pit, and then it caused a crack. Kind of, kind of like you know, you try to pull, you try to pull a uh, something apart, a plastic bag. Trying to open up a bag of potato chips, you can't do it. You cut it one little bit, and it pops right away. So that's what a fatigue origin is. It helps 
it okay. basically starts the, the process. Corrosion pits are the best way to happen, okay, which is poor maintenance. Now, what I've seen, and this is in Cardinals and 210s is, and this is 15, 20 years ago, is if you as a maintainer, I'm gonna shout out to the camera right now, is that if you as a maintainer are not dropping the, um, if you're not dropping the headliner, you're not dropping the insulation, at least every couple of years, if the aircraft's inside, great, but if it's outside or is, is spends any time outside, that headliner needs to come down. It's uh, a lot of mechanics will, during annual inspections, it's just a headliner, there's nothing up there, it won't drop. The well, I know, is, my mechanic, my mechanic, when I asked him about this, he says he pulls it down every annual. Yeah. But you'll have some folks that even in the Cessna checklist, it doesn't they really. Don't. It's too much it, work. It's it's a hassle because on yours, it's a the later model aircraft. It's a form piece. It's about right. six feet long, and it's trying to you know you're trying to wrestle a mattress almost. So a, a lot of times those aircraft will never get inspected. Mm. Um, again, as a maintainer, that needs to be inspected. Now, okay, so so number one for all the two hundred and ten owners out there and one hundred and seventy seven owners that that are affected by this, uh, they need to ask their mechanic, "Have you been inspecting this?" Yes, okay. inspect it and then treat it. So again, it's a maintenance type of thing that needs to be done. These right. are older aircraft, so that's it. So let's talk about the, the accident now, aircraft. Yeah. So the accident aircraft in May, and this is kind of a fast moving, kind of a fast moving uh, trip right now. In May 26 is the incident, okay? And again, the FA and the Australian folks talk back and forth. In June of 24, Cessna has service letter, uh, SEL, um, I forget what the number is. There's a SEL, I think it's 56. But a service letter went Service out. letter went out to the 177 family and one to the 210 family. Okay, and both of those, basically the same thing. The Cardinal, the Cardinal being a lighter loaded aircraft, if you have anything over 2,500 hours, you've got to inspect. On the 210s, if the aircraft's older than 1,500 hours, which I'm sure you're well over that, right. you've got to inspect. And what do you have to do? You've got to drop the headliner down. You've got to clean the spar off, inspect it. If there is some, if there is some damage, possible damage, you have to go and blend it if it can be blended, which means uh, smoothing it out and whatnot, treating it, and then the service letter. Again, if you're not 135 in the U.S. under FARs, if you're not 135 or 121, you don't have to comply they're not with com it. They're not mandatory. Not mandatory for a service letter. But what they recommend is you have a full eddy current inspection of a lower spar cap. Okay, so I've heard that term for eddy current inspection. Yeah. What is that? Eddy current is uh, kind of an ultrasonic. It's again, I'm not I'm not an expert on non-destructive testing, but essentially you've got to get a technician in, and they do a scan, specialized equipment, specialized test, uh, whatnot. But you have to come in and, and actually scan the spar area for that. You map it in quarter inch. Actually, believe it or not, quarter inch quadrants, and then you map the whole bottom spar. And at this point, what Cessna wants you to do is map the spar, write down everything, what's your time, service, mods, et cetera, and get that information back to Cessna. Oh, so that they can then compare, like two years later, you send your new eddy current thing and you well, can see. Well, it's, it's, right now this is a one-time shot. Okay. Okay. And oh, what so they, they just want to see that. Yeah. And right now they don't know what they don't know. Now you, you talk about, we talked about a little bit of break, um, you know, when does an AD happen? And air witness direct. Right. So, so where, so they sent out a service letter, but that's not a. Is that the same thing as a right. service so bulletin? Cessna sent. Uh, no, kind of. Yes. Okay. Okay. For 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 all intents and purposes, sure. So on June 24th, they sent out the service letter. Three days later, the FAA sent out a air witness concern sheet. Again. Not an not, AD. Not an AD. Not mandatory. But what the FAA wants is they want to know what your total time of service is, mod the modifications of the aircraft. In increased gross weights, engines, right. propellers, things like that. Any other STCs that were uh, were uh, included, and then um, what type of service? You know, is it is it just driving to Maine and back, or are you loading it up to max gross weight and doing patterns? Are you doing it for flight training? And again, they're trying to establish a database. Right. They don't know what they don't know yet. Okay, so they're in the establishing a database thing. Do we need it? Is this an automatic AD coming down the, the pipeline? Not necessarily AD. Again, the only time you call me is when you got wing spar problems. Remember the Piper deal? Right. Right. Okay, very similar. What will happen is once they gather the data and work with Cessna, Cessna right. will work with them, they're going to put some uh, information together, get their data together, and then probably have recommendations. It could be, worst case, an airworthiness directive that comes out and says, you must do something. You must replace 
your wing spar in so many hours, worst case scenario. Otherwise, it could be uh, as benign as a special airworthiness inspection bulletin, which says, by the way, every year or so, make sure you pull the headliner down and look at this thing. So, so maybe just visual inspection. Yeah, visual inspection. Again, now, going back to the eddy current, do we, I, as a 210 owner, do I need to get an eddy current done on my wing spar? Are you saying that's what they're saying I, I have to? Well, nothing have to at this point, unless I was 135. But um, where we... Where, well, look at, my deal is, what do you have? So if you pull your headliner down and your aircraft has been inspected every year, right. and your inspection, your, your authorized inspection, your IA, has been looking at that and it looks beautiful. In fact, what I've done is typically Cessna aircraft or bare aluminum. Years ago, when we, again, when I bring an aircraft in, I'll go and inspect it, and then I iodine it and prime it. It's painted. So now I've got a barrier coating. It's clean, okay, right. because I know that aircraft age. But if I have an aircraft that's been sitting on the tie downs for 40 years in Louisiana. Oh gosh. Exactly. It depends on where the, where the service is. Or if it's been sitting in a hangar in Arizona, different right. type of deal, right? Right. Um, but the biggest thing is go up there and physically, the maintainer needs to physically put their eyes on that spar and see what you need to see is nothing but beautiful metal. All right. Doesn't it take more than just one accident before an a uh, FAA will issue an AD? I always equate it to golf, okay? Yeah. You, you go out and play golf, what do you get? You know, you boff the first hole, the, the first ball, what do you get? You get a, a mulligan, mulligan, right? Right. In the FAA world, you get a mulligan. Okay. In that, you have one instance, uh, and again, we, we go back to things uh, even in the airliner world, but you get one mulligan in that something bad happened. The second time something bad happens, game over. Okay. okay. So has there been a second time yet no, on this? It has not. Um, okay. Now, this is what I try to tell folks about or this directives. Oftentimes you'll hear folks say, well, the company's just trying to sell parts. Well, see, that's what I was wondering, too, is because, you know, I would think that with the, the eddy current inspection that's highly specialized, if I've got that, if I've got a company that happens to have that, I'm going, come on, AD, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're pushing it, saying, oh, look how bad these wing spars are. Yeah. And, and then it becomes marketing, not really safety. Right, and that's where the FAA is going to separate the wheat from the chaff, and they, their, their findings, final findings, have got to be based on engineering and proper knowledge. Hopefully. Scientific. So, yeah, yeah you're not going to see that kind of pressure, so to speak, put on it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, real, real, real important. That's the deal. Again, my deal is, if you see an error in this directive, as I tell folks, it take... It, to me, it's serious. Right. That means at least one person has died, at least two people have died. So when the FAA push into there with this directive, don't take it lightly. Okay. Okay, so, and, and I see that and sometimes in the experimental world, they say, I don't have to deal with air witness directives. Well, you may not have to, but you sure want to. Now, with regards to service letters, that I would put, because it's a thing, and you've got an aircraft that's not just brand new, is you want to make sure that you address it and inspect it. Right. And most importantly is treat that lower spar area. Have your maintainer go in and treat that, that spar area. Make sure there's no corrosion and just, that's a that's the golden part of your aircraft. Right. Hang on to it. All right. So it's real, real important to, to keep after it. All right. Okay, thanks, Bill. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's really, really, really good information. Okay, so for all of you 210 and 177 owners out there that are wondering, the takeaway here is that you need to get your maintainer to inspect that wing spar. And it should be done on a regular basis too. Um, it's never a bad idea. Make sure that they take the steps to pull down that liner, pull out the insulation, and get a good look at, at what's going on up there. Remember, keep safe out there, and we'll see you next time in the hangar.